Go to Acts chapter 19. We looked at this particular passage in Adam's class. I guess it's been a while ago now. But it stuck with me because these people here were ignorant of the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 19, we'll read just the first two verses. It says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Well, I'd like to think upon who the Holy Ghost is, what his purpose is, if you will. Yeah. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, we... We do thank you for this opportunity to gather with our people tonight, Lord, and to look into thy word once again. I pray that we put worldly thoughts aside and focus on the message that's brought forth, Lord. I pray that you'd help me, Lord, to feed your sheep tonight. I pray that you might bless it as it goes out over the internet as well. I pray that you be a part of Larry as he's out sick, that you might heal him up, Lord, you might give him some reprieve from this effects of this vaccine, Lord. I pray that you would so it would be better and be able to go back to work and be back with us this Lord's Day. I do pray for each request that is mentioned for Brother Jackson, Lord, you might work your will away in his life, Lord, and get your will for him to move here. I pray you work out the details, Lord. I do thank you for Christ and his sacrifice and for your goodness and faithfulness towards us. I pray you might even be pleased to save lost souls here among us tonight. Lead God and direct for the Holy Spirit, Lord. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Yeah. Here Paul had came to Ephesus, and he says, and it says he asked them if they'd received the Holy Ghost. Their response was they didn't, hadn't even heard whether there would be a Holy Ghost. You know, I think most of us have heard of the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, as it's sometimes called. Also, the Spirit of Truth, of sometimes just this, the Spirit, other times, the Spirit of God as well. So, we may have heard of the Holy Ghost, but I'm afraid we're probably, or many professing Christians at least, are as ignorant as these believers were here of who the Holy Ghost was, or should I say who He is. So, when we were discussing in Adam's class, this verse we were talking about them having received the Holy Ghost. That's not my intent for the night, but that is an interesting thought there. How they had said they had not. He asked them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? But they had not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Yeah. And we do a pretty poor job of telling about the Holy Ghost today, don't we? That's right. One, it seems that we prefer the title of Holy Spirit, but there's nothing wrong with that. But Holy Ghost is used quite often in Scripture as well. You know, the Pentecostals seem to kind of claim that as their own for some reason, though. But the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, He is just as much God as the rest, is it not? He is, in a sense, more passive, if you will, as far as the Scriptures are concerned. But he is very much active today. He's, hmm. say, the most active as far as in our lives, right. directly. So we we often refer to him as the third part of the Godhead, but he is certainly not the least important. Nah. The Holy Spirit, we see him as early as the second verse of Scripture, Genesis 1, verse 2, when it says the Spirit of God was upon the face of the earth. Well, he was active in creation. In fact, when you look on down to verse 26, when God said, let us make man our image after our likeness, was he, he I see, think that he was referring to all three parts of the Godhead, seeing that he made man a trichotomy, as we say, body, soul, and spirit, just as God is Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But we, generally think of Jehovah as referring to the Father and Jesus as referring to the Son, but we don't have a 
specific name tied to the Holy Spirit. But really, they are all one and the same, aren't they? There's probably as many different beliefs, theories, whatever you want to call them, on the Trinity as there are of cereal in the grocery aisle. So I tried to research some of them, and I was a little bit overwhelmed just with the many different views that so-called Christians have. You know, all the way from our view that He is God and just as much equal as the rest of the Godhead. To, there's some that believe the Father is supreme, Son subordinate to Him, and then the Holy Spirit subordinate to both of those. Some view each part of the Godhead as individual gods, if you will. Some view each one as a man, different manifestation of God. You know, it's that really the, Jesus was a father come down in the flesh. That's not biblical correct either. God is three persons in one God. It's somewhat hard for this human mind to comprehend at times, but yet that is what the Bible teaches. And you have all the way to the other end of the spectrum that says the Holy Spirit is not God at all. He's just the, the energy of God, if you will. Or the, and when God speaks, that's the Holy Spirit. That all, in my experience, that always leads to eventually denying the divinity of Christ as well. Right. But who is the Holy Spirit here? You know, I thought it was interesting that the first person who the Bible says was had the Spirit of God in him was Joseph. You know, it doesn't say that about Noah or Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I'm not saying they didn't have the Holy Spirit, but Genesis 41:38. This very first instance of anyone being directly mentioned as they had the Holy Spirit within them. And it's speaking of Joseph. In fact, it was Pharaoh who said it. So can we find one such as this man in whom the Spirit of God dwells? Well, Joseph and everything that he did was an example of how a believer ought to act. Yeah. If anyone in the Old Testament was filled with the Holy Spirit, it was probably him. So let's go over to Matthew for a moment. Let's consider the Holy Spirit here, mostly in the New Testament. He certainly is in the Old Testament. He's usually referred to as the Spirit of God, sometimes as the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 12. And for those who seem to think that the Holy Spirit is not God or is less God or less important. To me, this verse kind of takes that whole theory away. I'm sure we've all heard it before. Matthew 12, verses 31 and 32 say, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world neither in the world to come. Well, this, you know, people get in a lot of debates about what is this blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. You know, maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but blasphemy is just you know, speaking evil against it, is it? So he says, it shall be forgiven him if he speaks blasphemy, or says, speak of the word against the Son of Man. But not if he speaks against the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost certainly is not a less significant part of God. Yeah. He goes even further to say, it shall not be forgiven in this world, neither in the world to come. I'm not so certain that the child of God then can commit this sin. So it shall never be forgiven him, it says. The world to come, in my understanding, is a world that Wherein dwells righteousness, Peter writes, it's that everlasting world that we shall dwell in with Christ and God forever. <clears throat> so it shall never be forgiven him, it says, if he is, commits this blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. So what is the purpose of the Holy Ghost? I guess what my thinking was tonight. Let's go to Ephesians for a moment. Ephesians chapter 1. 
know if Paul, I don't know if Paul was trying to clear up some things about the Holy Spirit to the Ephesians if they didn't hadn't heard about him at all when he first encountered them. But here he speaks several times about the Holy Spirit in his letter. Uh, Brother Jackson mentioned this last week in his message here, but verses 13 and 14 say, In whom ye also trusted after ye heard the word, this is speaking of Christ, and we trusted in him after he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. First he says we are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And that's I believe he put his stamp on us, if you will, his signet, if you will, that, that preserves us, it seals us, it really acts as a security for us. And then he goes on to say that which is the earnest of our inheritance. Earnest being a pledge, if you will, a down payment would be the modern day equivalent. Now this is a strong enough argument for security to believe we're here to me. That he gave us the Holy Spirit as the earnest of our inheritance. As the, our seal, if you will. That he gave us the Holy Spirit really as a sign that he will finish the work he has begun in us. The problem is when many people today are trusting in something else, aren't they? That they're going to keep their salvation, that their good works are going to be enough for them. No, we just need to simply trust God. He gave us his spirit and that is enough, isn't it? That should be enough promise that he will finish what he has begun in us. Oh. Let's turn back to John chapter 4 for just a moment. I think we're all familiar with this verse. <laughs> Here the woman was at the well. Christ was speaking to her. Down in verse 13 of chapter 4 it says, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drink of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. You might say, what does that do with the Spirit of God? Well, John chapter 7, I'll turn there so I can't quite quote it. John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39 here. Christ says, In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up, or stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me. And drink. That sounds a lot like we told the Samaritan woman. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So here's that living water again. Notice what John says in the next verse. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. The Holy Spirit was not yet given because the Jesus was not yet glorified. The Holy Spirit would be this fountain of living water, if you will. That will never run dry. That's why it is really the perfect earnest of our inheritance, if you will, the perfect pledge for our redemption. That the Holy Spirit is not going to dry up one day. The Holy Spirit's not going to leave us high and dry. But it shall be a, as it says, well, let me turn back there. It there, it shall be a well of water springing up in everlasting life. But forever and ever, that well will never run dry. Right. Living water was not something that Christ has made up either. It's found in the Old Testament. Right. Jeremiah chapter 2. I'm going to turn there and read this for us real quick. Because it, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. We'll also find it in chapter 17, verse 13. Jeremiah 2, 13 says, 
For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and those second and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. God describes himself here as the fountain of living waters. Further concrete in our fact that the Holy Spirit is God. But the Israelites, they said they had forsaken him. And they said they hewed out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. That is the tendency of the flesh, though, isn't it? When we leave God to go do our own thing. You know, they had a fountain of living water, everlasting well of living water. Yet it says they hewed them out broken cisterns that can hold no water. You know, good works are broken cisterns, aren't they? Believing that you can keep your own salvation, that's really a broken cistern that can hold no water. Believe really anything but Besides Christ and his finished work is really hewing out a cistern, a broken cistern that can hold no water. But really when we doubt the Holy Spirit, we're really doubting God. <coughs> so just as the Israelites were guilty of forsaking the fountain of living water and hewing themselves out their own cisterns that could hold no water, so are many today who are guilty of doing the same thing. They leave off, they left God's way and went about doing it their own way. They promote the quote unquote free will of man as being greater than really the drawing of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Is that, is that really not what Arminianism teaches? That you know, if the free will of man so chooses, they can resist God, they can resist the Holy Spirit that. You take it to its farthest end. You know, the Holy Spirit's not good enough to seal us either, because you can lose your salvation. Anyway, you know, let's. So we see that He was our seal and our earnest of our inheritance. And go on to John chapter 16. Another reason for the Holy Spirit. John 16, verse 13. It says, How be it? When he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you the things to come. This is also found in chapter 14, verse 26. Same thought. We won't turn there, but notice he will guide you into all truth. If you want to know the truth of God, just follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You know, nothing wrong with Bible colleges and Sunday school and all that is all needful, but ultimately it's the Spirit of God that has to guide you in truth. Now the Spirit of God, he uses Brother Larry and Brother Kenny and Brother Adam and Brother Junior to teach us truth. But if we just simply repeat what they say, it's not really believing the truth, is it? So the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth, he says. The problem is we don't often follow his leading, do we? No, we must simply follow his leading and he will guide us in the truth. There won't be any debate on, oh, is this okay or is that not okay? Does the Bible really mean that or does it mean this? We have debates and debates and debates among so-called Christians and yet the Holy Spirit is guiding us. There's not more than one interpretation, if you will. The spirit, the scriptures can mean mean what they mean, and that's really all there is to it. Now, I know the spirit of God has to reveal it to you. He has to reveal the deep things, if you will. The man can read the scriptures; he can see them for surface value. He may can read what other men have wrote and say, "Yeah, that's what it means." But when the Holy Spirit reveals them to you, you'll be convicted of it, if you will. You know, I, was, I know most of y'all know I was saved, some of you, and that's where I spent my young Christian years, if you will. But yet the Spirit of God is what taught me the truth, not Brother Rich or Brother Trescott or 
Even my Sunday school teacher, Brother Horace. God, all used, God used all of them. But I came to the doctrines of grace by the leading of the Holy Spirit. I came to the church truth by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Oh. God used Brother Larry to teach me a lot about the doctrines of separation. It was the Holy Spirit that had to teach me. Otherwise, I would just be repeating what someone else had said. That's really what the Pharisees did, weren't they? They weren't really convicted of the Scripture. They just they were very well learned in them. They knew what the law said. They knew exactly how to keep the rituals, if you will. But there was really there was no real belief behind it. But when the Holy Spirit, He will guide us in all truth. Let's turn over to Ephesians chapter five. I think the reason we don't we're not we're filled with the Holy Spirit because we're filled with too much other stuff, aren't we? Ephesians chapter five, verse eighteen says, "And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit, or be ye filled with the Spirit." So we can be contrast being filled with the Spirit with being with being filled with wine. We fill ourselves up with a lot of other things, don't we? Mm -hmm. With this world, the things of this world, our jobs, our money, our house, our cars, whatever it may be. There would be more power in our churches if we would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Still. And we would be better guided into all truth if we'd be filled with the Holy Spirit. We have, I think we would see more souls saved, more people convicted of sin. If there was more people filled with the Spirit in the churches. Yeah. But we want to be, you know, we want to be like half filled, it seems like. So we can be filled with the world and filled with the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't work that way, does it? We can't fill ourselves up with the things of this world and expect God to say, well, yeah, I'll, I'll take up the rest of the room. Mm. And what? I know we, most of you all heard the saying before, you can't shack up the devil and expect God to pay the rent. <laughs> we can't have it both ways in Christ. In fact, said that you can't have two masters where you will cling to the one, hate the other, or we will love, love the one and despise the other. Be not drunk with wine, where is excess will be filled with the Spirit. And we see men filled with Spirit in the Scriptures, and they did great things, if you will. Stephen, he was filled with the Spirit, and he preached. And he didn't really care what they had to say about it. And ultimately, they stoned him for it, as we know the rest of the story. They took him out of the city and stoned him, and they laid their clothes on a young man's feet. His name was Saul. Same Saul who we write about the Holy Spirit now. Being filled with the Spirit will certainly empower us to do great things in service for God. There's primarily two ways, though, that we keep ourselves from being filled with the Spirit. First is found in the previous chapter, chapter 4. Verse number 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed on the day of redemption. We, we grieve the Holy Spirit, we can't be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, to grieve Him, it means that we distress him, we really cause him grief or sorrow. I think the primary way we do this is by letting sin into our lives. God is not pleased, Holy Spirit included, when we have sin in our lives. Yeah. We certainly we can't be filled with God or filled with the Holy Spirit if we have sin in our lives. Certainly we we're not following his leading if we have sin in our lives. The Holy Spirit will not lead us to sin. And I think the other way in which we keep ourselves from being filled is I think we all know the verse in 1 Thessalonians 5 19, quench not the Spirit. You know, quench means to suppress or to stifle, to extinguish. And when you quench your throat or your thirst, you're trying to get rid of your thirst. 
and drinking something. We quench the Holy Spirit by not following His leading. No, when He lays something on our heart and we don't do it, we're quenching Him. Yeah. Yeah. Those two ways, and along with being filled with other things, is how we keep ourselves from being filled with the Holy Ghost. No. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 3. As I mentioned, the Holy Spirit will not lead us to sin. It really will not lead us to anything contrary to the Word of God. Really, He is the, the author of the Word of God, isn't He? He is the one who moved the prophets. He is the one who moved the apostles to the right. He is the one who moved the Every last one who penned the word of God. Second Peter 1.21 tells us the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Here, 1 Corinthians 12.3 says, Wherefore I give unto you, give to you understanding that no man speaketh, or speaking by the Holy Spirit, calleth Jesus cursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost, first and foremost, leads us to Christ. Without Him, we cannot say that He is Lord. Really, it's the Holy Ghost, which, maybe there's a better way to say this, but He's the one who enables us to believe. Yeah. Without Him, we cannot believe. Without Him, we will not believe. But no man that calleth Jesus accursed is speaking by the Spirit of God. You know, I don't like to call out people, but that church, so-called over in Madisonville, they're not following the Holy Ghost. And they say that Christ is not, or when they say that Jesus is not the Christ, that Jesus is not the Messiah. Well, first they denied the Holy Spirit. I knew right there that was a big red flag. Then they went on to deny the divinity of Christ. And then they went on to deny that Christ was even any more than a good man who taught the Torah. No man who teaches such things can be by the Spirit of God. But oh, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost here, He teaches us that Christ is Lord, doesn't He? He teaches us first and foremost that Jesus is Savior. With John chapter 3, we all know that, that I believe that it's by the Spirit we are born again. Really, without the Holy Ghost, there would be no Redemption with her. And Christ paid the debt. Christ delivered us if we were from sin, but it's the Holy Spirit which performs that work in us. He's the one who births us anew and, like I said, for lack of a better way to put it, enables us to believe on Christ. Without Him, we would not believe. Right. Let's turn to John chapter 3. I know we all know that scripture, but I want to read it for us before we close. John chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, You must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listens, and now hears the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh. Whither it goes, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. You must be born again, he says. We use that phrase quite often, but do we know what it means? And we have not, it's not raising your hand and repeating the prayer. It's not making a decision for Jesus. It's not being baptized. And really, you had nothing to do with your flesh of birth. Yet you think you can decide on when you're going to be spiritually born? No, you must be born of the Spirit. You must be born again of God, if you will. <clears throat> that is wholly the work of the Holy Spirit. I always found that verse 8 interesting here. It says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound there, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. The word that's translated as spirit, both in the Hebrew and the Greek, are 
sometimes used as wind or breath. The Holy Spirit moves like the wind, doesn't he? You can't see where he's going or where he came from, but yet when he comes to you, you can feel him. When we, when we meet here, the Holy Spirit meets with us, you can feel that he's here. I don't know if you're in your car or in your prayer closet, wherever it may be that you're trying to meet with God, the Holy Spirit meets with you, you can tell he's there. But where he came from or where he goes, if you will, you can't tell. And just the same, if you're not saved, and when the Holy Spirit comes to deal with you, you'll know it. I recall back to my own salvation. You know, I went to that revival meeting there, some of you, the first two nights, I was in the flesh. I didn't, nothing was really special about it. But, well, the Holy Spirit came and dealt with me on that third night. So when the Holy Spirit comes your way, you'll certainly know it. Go to be born again of the Holy Spirit is what you need if you're not saved here. It's not that you need to do enough good work. It's not that you need to trust in baptism or that you go to church every Sunday even or every Sunday and Wednesday. To simply be born again of the Holy Spirit that he may enable you to believe. And the flesh might make a quote unquote profession, it might say, yeah, Jesus is Christ, Jesus is Savior, but to believe in the heart, that takes the Holy Spirit. That takes really the new creature which the Holy Spirit makes us. Which with the heart man believeth, Romans 10 says, the natural heart though is wicked and depraved. In fact, Jeremiah says it's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. The natural heart won't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The natural heart does not even like to think that they need a Savior, that it needs a Savior. Yeah. But when God bursts you new through the Holy Ghost, then you'll know you need a Savior. Then you'll know immediately that, you, that Christ is the only one that is sufficient. You know, as I preached Friday night, we're all lacking. But you're especially lacking if you're outside of Christ. Yeah. But well, Christ, he is sufficient. I'll go ahead and close with that thought. <clears throat>